Hey guys, my name is Nicole Sande and today I'm going to be sharing my testimony with you. I'm going to be talking a little bit about how I became a scholarship recipient. Not just any scholarship recipient, honey. I am a McCall McBain scholarship recipient. The first in the, the first period. <laughs> yeah, and I'll leave some maybe here maybe there some details about the scholarship but mainly i wanna i've made a list let me show you all i've made a list <laughs> these are the things i'm gonna be talking about today shedding some light about how i got here i guess the first thing i should really start off is you know how i heard about the scholarship so i actually received a, an email from the Queen's Scholarship Committee or awards team saying, hey, are you thinking about applying for your grad studies? If you are, you should try McGill. There's a scholarship, blah, blah, blah. Cool, I'm like, you know what? I have time, let me uh, attend the intro session. So I went and they're talking about this inaugural scholarship, first cohort, all this stuff. And it's sounding really good. Like I am convinced, okay? But in my mind, I'm thinking about like, okay, how am I gonna get into the school? Cause yeah, scholarship is cute, scholarship is great, but you have to get into the school. So applying to the scholarship is one thing, but applying into the school is another. And the way I am, so I was in thir I'm finishing up my third year when I got this email. And in my third year, I had done a lot of research about masters, like a lot of research. I had looked into uh, University of Waterloo, Western, University of Guelph, U of T. I had looked at a, lot, a, bu a bunch of different universities and I had also looked at McGill. And one thing I was specifically looking for was that they were going to be looking at my last two years on my transcript. The reason why this was really important to me is because I really struggled in my second year. And I, at the time, I had carried a lot of shame in that. So I'm just like, listen, no, I don't want nobody looking at my second year transcripts. If they're not looking at my, you know, last two years, then dash it to the side. Lo and behold, I go and look at McGill's website and it says your cumulative GPA. And I'm thinking, I was, it was very annoying at the time. Like I was very like disheartened because you know I put so much work in my third year. In my third year, in my third year, I made dean's list. I worked like a crazy woman. Um, and yes, I got my GPA for the year up. Like it was really good. My cumulative GPA was still being anchored down because of how poorly I performed in my second year. And I'll get into my you know my second year um, a little bit. Uh, more but before I talk about that I want to talk about you know getting a scholarship to come to Queens because that's the whole reason why I sort of like you know was interested in this scholarship so um, to come to Queens I actually got a scholarship called the Bank of Montreal major admission award so Queens has these uh, so you have your your entrance award which is a kind of like standard uh, you know if you have an A plus you get two thousand dollars or six thousand dollars if you get a two thousand dollars so so on and so forth but they also have these things called major admission awards which are um awards that have been you know sponsored by a donor um usually in large amounts for specific needs whether that's financial need whether that's to encourage more people of indigenous backgrounds to come to queens there's a bunch of different um what's the word uh niches no there's a, there's, a, there's a bunch of different focuses for the different scholarships. And when I was looking at coming to Queens, I was like, how the hell am I gonna play for this? How am I going to pay for this? Like, dead ass. Like, that was the only thing I was thinking about. I'm like, okay, my grades aren't good enough to get into the school. That's cute, that's fine. But I need to pay for this. I'm looking at residents and I knew I wanted to live by myself. Like, the whole living with another person thing. Call me a sport brat, whatever. I was not gonna do it. It was gonna cost me about $16,000 plus my tuition fees, which is about 7,000 something. So I'm like, I'm looking at 24. I'm like, who is paying for this? Who is financing this, you know? And I did have a little bit of, my mom had a little bit of money saved up, I had a couple of scholarships, but it wasn't gonna cover, it would cover maybe my tuition fees, but it wouldn't cover my residence fees, you know? And I looked into living off campus, but a lot of people didn't recommend, you know, living off campus in your first year, you know, and moving away from home. So. In my mind, I'm like, okay, I need to come up with about $24,000 in scholarship money. And I had about eight-ish. And I'm just thinking, okay, like, I need a scholarship. So on in like 
end of November, I'm doing like some research on Queens and I find out about these major admission awards. And I look at the deadline and it says December, December 1st, 2016. And I'm just like, shit, I have six days to send this in. And I'm looking at the scholarship application and I'm like, okay, so when I look at it, I think I'm applying for the Queen's Chancellor Award. And specifically, I, at the time, I was still like not 100% convinced about going to computing. I was still kind of like in that whole like, you know, let me do this pre-med route minus the physics. And Queen's had this program called QUARMS or QUARMS, which stands for Queen's University Accelerated Route to Medicine. So I thought I was gonna do that. And to do that, you have to uh, get you have to get the Queen's Chancellor, you have to apply for the Chancellor Award. And to get, to apply for the Chancellor Award, you have to get uh, sponsored or like endorsed by your school, right? Nominated, nominated is the word. <laughs> you have to get nominated by your schools. So I'm thinking, okay, so I need to get nominated. I need to get this package up together. I need to do all these things in six days, bet. I wasn't even like, oh, I don't have a lot of time. I'm like, I'm gonna get it done. And the one thing is like, I had a very good rapport with the teachers and principal at my school. So I wasn't really too worried about that. I was just more so worried that, you know, like just making sure that my, my application would be top notch because for all the other scholarships that I had applied for, I'd work on those for months. But this one, I was gonna be working on it for a week. But luckily, um, because I had applied to a bunch of other scholarships, I had like other essays and things that I could use just kind of like bring things together, that sort of thing. So um, the day of the, the day that I'm supposed to submit the scholarship application in, um, one of my references, she, I went to her office and she wasn't there. And I'm like, shit, I was banking on this. You know, I was banking on this application, this reference letter, this money to get into this school. Like for me, it was, it was this or nothing. And so I went to her office, knock, knock, not there. And I'm like, frick. And I was part of this club in high school, uh, Smile Warriors. And one of my, uh, team members she's like oh why don't you check the the library and see if you know there's a teacher there that, that can help you you know write something or that can get a hold of the teacher that was supposed to actually give me a reference letter uh when i went to the to the the library i saw this teacher she's an english teacher and so i knew like okay if anybody can write a reference letter for me it's the english teacher okay so i went to her while she was with another student i was like i'm like miss i'm not gonna say her name just because she, she might not want her name and put, put on blast like that i was like miss i have a, a scholarship application it's due today i'm missing a reference letter can you help me she's like okay nicole give me one second and she, like i said she was attending to another student and i'm by the the front the front of the library i'm waiting like 10 minutes i'm just looking at the time i'm like oh my god it's 3 30 like i'm getting really scared that i'm not gonna be able to hand in this on time she comes to me if there's a word if there's a person that represents clutch like clutch in the human form this teacher is it. When I say she got me all the way together, she got me all the way together. Like she didn't, she did not miss a beat. She did not miss a beat. She went dum dum dum. Like she, like she was just so helpful. Like till this very day, like I still owe her so many, many, many things. Like I can never stop giving thanks to her because if, if not for her, if I didn't get that scholarship, I would have not been at Queens because I dead ass could not afford it. Anyways. She helps me get my application in. She's like, keep me updated, cool. A month goes by and I get the notification from the QARMS committee saying that I didn't get QARMS. And at this point, I wasn't too disappointed. Like, yes, I was disappointed, but you know, it was a very, it was a very uh, competitive program. And I knew my grades were, my average was about like a 91 at the time. I'm thinking like, people are going into this thing having an average of like 95. They said the minimum cutoff was 90%. So I knew that my, my average was, just there, barely competitive, you know what I mean? So I wasn't like too stumped on that. What really hurt me was that I didn't get this scholarship, you know? I got a message, I got an email saying that you didn't get the, the chancellor's scholarship. And so I was devastated. My mom was, um, she was cooking and I told her and we both just looked at each other like, okay, so what now? I didn't even have a time to process being sad. It was just like, okay, what is the next option? And so I talked to a couple of teachers and they were like, you know what, Nicole, like, if you don't get a really big scholarship, like apply for small ones and hope that, you know, get the money that you need in small, small scholarships. And so I did that. I applied to a couple of BBPA scholarships, which is uh, the Black Business Professional Association. They are clutch. If you're a Black and you've not applied to one of their scholarships, hunty, 
Anyway, so I applied for that. I applied for a bunch of these other scholarships, but it was getting to me that I wasn't getting a big scholarship because I put so much like time and effort in high school. Like after grade 10, I became a new person. Like, you know, Nicole, you know, she was getting good grades in high school, cool, cool, cool. But then grade 10, after grade 10, it was like this. Like I was really like putting in effort. I'd come to school like sometimes at like eight o'clock in grade 11 to get st stuff done. I'd be in my math teachers, you know, uh, after in her in her class after school to like 6 p.m. trying to like really grasp you know topics and so I'm thinking like you know have I not done enough to get a scholarship and all my friends around me are talking about how they got this scholarship and they got that scholarship and I am not getting any scholarships I'm really feeling like okay something is wrong with me but I didn't voice this to anybody because I was too ashamed to really like to like with chest be like oh I didn't get anything like da, da, da. like you know I was I was not proud of the fact that I didn't have anything to show forth of my effort, you know what I mean? Or so I thought, okay? And then, as God would have it, as my God, the God that I serve would have it, in April, just a regular day, you know, my mom's in the, you know, she's watching her Korean dramas in the in the living room, I'm in the dining room doing my, my work on the, on the desktop, and I go into my Gmail, and I see congratulations. And so I'm thinking like, I've already got all my acceptances from my high school, my university, so like, what is, what is congratulations? I open it and I look at the thing, it says Queen's Award something something. Congratulations, you've won the Bank of Montreal Award for 40,000 zwols. Hey! <laughs> Guys, I can't. <laughs> Y'all don't understand. So at this point, April, I'd already fallen in love with the school. I already accepted in good faith, okay? I had accepted in good faith that I was going to the school come what May, honey. And I'm looking for this money. And I'm, I've applied for all the scholarships, but they've not really gotten back to me yet. So at this at this point, I'm still minus like 16,000 dollars, okay? And I get the scholarship application telling me that it's $40,000 across the four years, so $10,000 each year. And I literally burst it out like in tears. Like, I was like, mom, mom. I got $40,000 and I was looking to make sure it wasn't spam. Like one thing about me is like, I don't just believe what I see. Like I gotta verify, best believe I called them the next week and made sure that this was not a, you know, no fake stuff. But in that initial moment, I was so like, I was so pumped up full of joy because in my mind, I'm thinking like, where did this come from? Like, I was like, are they, sh cause in my mind, I'm like, I didn't apply for this. Timmy Dio or signed it. I didn't apply for this. Like. What are you talking about? I got a Bank of Montreal scholarship. I did not apply. I did not apply. You know, that's what I'm thinking. Like, I didn't apply for this, you know? And I just remember feeling so, like, happy. And then when I called the admissions team, uh, not the admissions team, the awards team at Queens, they said that, oh, you applied um, for the ma major admission awards. I'm like, yes, I applied for the Chancellor Award so that I could get into QRMs. They're like, well, when you apply for the major admission awards, you, get, you apply for all of the awards. So little did I know that teacher, that's why I said I owe her so much. She didn't just help me for that one Dega Dega scholarship. She helped me for the entire scholarship, honey. Like, and the reason why I didn't get that scholarship was because, because they thought I was better suited for this scholarship based off, off my financial needs, my, my grades, my leadership work, all those kind of stuff, right? And so I just remember feeling like out of nowhere, God just said, listen, child, listen, honey, like, I got you, you know? Now with chess, I could be like, yeah, I got a scholarship, now what? Mm -hmm. Like, I was just feeling really good, you know, because all this time, like, I've been listening to everybody talk about how they had this scholarship and that scholarship, you know? I'm a very competitive person, like, admittedly, like, I'm a very competitive person. I don't like feeling like you know, I'm not putting my best foot forward. And when you don't have anything to show for it, like it's one thing if people are just getting more scholarships than you. I wasn't quantifying it. Like it wasn't like, oh, this person got five, five scholarships and I only got one. No, but I just wanted to have one. You know, I just wanted to have one. You like, even if everybody else is getting like 10,000, whatever, I just wanted to get one, you know? And so that competitive spirit was coming out of me. I'm just like, Nicole, what are you not doing? You know, like I was looking at myself, doing a lot of introspection and be like, Nicole, you need to get it together. And God said, uh, 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 it's not about you. Hold on. Come and see what the Lord has done. Uh, period. Like, I, I can't explain how that made me feel. Anyways, 
So because of that scholarship, a lot of things came, came out to be from that scholarship. From that scholarship, I started Queen Student Diversity Project, which is a whole nother like, you know, topic of how that correlates. And I would attend different ceremonies from like, you know, different donors that, you know, have given to Queens and given to people like me that needed that, you know, financial help. And I also, because of that, put, you know, the Queens Awards um, emails like as a priority. So when I saw that email, I was like, okay, bet I'm gonna go to the info session. So I go to the info session, I'm like really feeling it, you know, like the lady was very thorough. And one thing that I got from that initial information session that it wasn't just about grades, you know, and it's and it was not just about grades, it was about leadership. And one thing about me, like I said, I'll get into that maybe in another video is that I had a very strong, solid background in leadership in high school. So when I came into university, I came with that same energy, you know, so they were really speaking my language, leadership, this entrepreneurship, that like talking about just different passion projects. Like it was really like, you know, hitting home with me. And it was good because prior to that, like when I thought of McGill, I just thought of cumulative GPA, not attainable, you know, GPA, GPA, not attainable. But then now that I'm, you know, going to this invitation, I'm thinking, okay, like, yeah, cumulative GPA, but also leadership. And I'm thinking like, if anybody has a portfolio on leadership, it's me. Like I've, I've definitely put my fair, you know, my fair share of leadership at Queens in the community. So I'm thinking, okay, like maybe this thing is more, in my reach than I might, you know, think. So I dedicated 2020 summer to like messaging professors from different universities, uh, messaging a professor at my university and really just trying to like figure out, okay, what master's program is right for me? Because the last summer, because of the whole pandemic thing, it uh, presented an opportunity for me to, you know, work two jobs remotely. So I worked as a data analyst, analyst. I worked as a data, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I worked as a data analyst at the systems analytics team of the undergraduate admissions office at Queens, and I also worked as a software developer uh, slash researcher for the Queens Mechanical Engineering um, in partnership with the Human Mobility Research Center at Queens. So I was working those two jobs, and I'm loving the software development. Like, I'm finally feeling like I'm actually, like, you know, doing something with all this like, you know, coding thing that they're giving me, you know, sometimes when you're just learning, 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 theory, 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 you're like, uh -huh, theory, theory, like, okay, what? Like, you know, but now I'm like finally doing it. I'm really, I'm really liking it. But then also I'm doing data analysis and you know, that kind of like excitement of like it being new and you also really liking it. I started questioning myself, like, do I really want to do software engineering, software development, or do I want to go into data analysis and data science and that kind of thing. So I was really kind of like not really sure what master's program to apply for. But when I was looking at the McGill GPA thing, I'm like, okay, maybe data science, computer science, I should go for that because they're talking more about like, you know, 3.5 GPA, 3.6, you know, and they're talking about 3.8, 3.9. I'm just like, honey, calm down. But at the end of the day, like my mom was like, you know, don't make it all about the GPA. Apply for what you want to. If it's for you, it's for you. So at the end of the day, data science is cool. I like it. But software engineering and, and specifically like medical device innovation is where my heart is at. And that's what I've been wanting to do from jump. Like from the moment I got into this program, I've been saying like, I want to build like, like hand robots and leg robots and all these like different, different stuff. Like, so I just felt like if I just went to this program because of the fact that it's, it's nice right now and like the GP seems more attainable for me, then I might end up regretting it and not just like going for it. So I spent that summer getting my, my, my package ready for the application because it was, it was open in like June and it closed in like September, I believe. And so I'm ready to go, ready to apply. And then just out of the blue, I just have like a wave of just self doubt. Oh, Nicole, you're not gonna get it. Yada, yada, yada. Why are you wasting your time? these scholarship applicants nationwide, they're gonna like beat you out, da da da. And I was trying to figure out like, you know, why am I, why am I self-destructing? You know, why am I doing this to myself? I've gotten this far and now I'm just like, a little small stuff I need to do and I'm telling myself I'm not gonna apply anymore. Like I decided I'm not gonna apply for this scholarship anymore. And I, I really think it really comes back again to my second year, even though the scholarship, like they've never really placed a really big emphasis on like your school, your, your grades have to be like the best of the best. Like, yes, your grades have to be good. Like that's, a, that's an academic requirement is part of it, but they've placed more emphasis on leadership and things that are more down my lane. But second year has really like, 
it's just, it's here. You know, like I've downplayed my second year experience because it was trash. That's all you really need to know. But like, there are many layers to why second year was trash and why I feel like the experience for black students and predominantly white institutions is just like, it's just next level. It's just disproportionate. It's not, you, like we talk about institutionalized racism a lot. We put, put all these words there, but then you don't really realize how it affects you until you're in it, until you're in the system. You're trying to figure it out and you're just like, wow, like, like, damn. And so I've been trying, like before making this video, I thought, how do I explain institutionalized racism to someone that doesn't understand it, who just thinks it's a buzzword, who thinks, you know, oh, like, you know, but we're, oh, not the ash, honey. Let me just put a disclaimer that my hands are ashy because I'd be washing my hands 24 seven because the corona ain't finna catch me in Jesus name. So um, in like planning this video in my head, I'm thinking, okay, how do I explain institutionalized racism to someone that maybe doesn't really understand how that impacts people? I thought about this long and hard and I figured it would be best to give an example of like a personal, a personal experience and, and hopefully you'd be able to understand and see the layers of it. So in my second year, like in second year, like a lot of people will tell you general consensus is that second year is a big step up from first year. First year, it, depending on your program, it might just feel like high level high school, in my opinion. But then in second year, you're getting into theory. So theory is like, you need to know your, your, your shit. So I want to stay away from like the difficulty of the program because I don't want anybody to think that, you know, the difficulty is the problem that I'm discussing here. It's not about how difficult it was. It was about the resources, rather the lack thereof of resources specifically to help black people in a predominantly white institution. So for me to explain this, I'm first going to explain what my daily process would look like. I was working as a residence Don, a computer science LLC Don. And part of that job, so I live in residence with the first years and I have to plan events for them, help them be like, be like their mentor living in residence. And that was very emotionally taxing. I, I love them, especially the, the students that I had in my second year or rather my first year of a Don, but my second year as a student, I loved them, but it was emotionally taxing. And I have all these events to, to plan. That was one job. And in my third year, I was also working as a proctor while being a, a residence Don. That was my second job. In my And then throughout my university experience, I've been president of QSDP, um, except for this uh, last year. But I've been founder and president of QSDP up until my third year. And I'm doing all this while working and while trying to get a degree. And I feel like for the average white person, yes, they're on clubs as well, but they're not juggling or carrying the weight of EDII initiatives the way that black people are, the way that marginalized communities are. I should explain what EDI works. That's equity, diversity, inclusion, and indigeneity. So EDII work is largely like spearheaded by black students on campus, by marginalized communities on campus. And we're putting in like more than a nine to five doing this work so that we're making a better community for people that look like us, for, for the community in general, but, but, but specifically for people that look like us. And we're not getting paid to do it. You know, there's no commission, there's nothing, you know, and we should be getting paid to, to do it, or we should at least have someone who is getting paid to do it to be in contact with, to liaise with, but for the most part, we're just doing this all by ourselves. My daily would look like in the morning, um, I would send an email to my executive members, about 20 of 20 of them. I start class at 8.30, usually end class around 5.30. Then I go to my meetings, QSTP meetings. Those would be about an hour and a half, sometimes, most times an hour. So by seven o'clock, I'm done. Then I go to my night class, 9.30, I'm done. Um, and then I have like an event for uh, that I'm facilitating for my students in residence or they're coming to me for questions about their assignments um, in first year. And so I'm doing this every day on a daily basis, you know, trying to fulfill my, my duties as a Don. And I'm, the reason why I'm a Don is because I couldn't afford to, to live off campus and pay rent. And even with my job, like my job was a work study. So like you're not getting paid that, that much. 
and so financially it just made more sense for me to, to live in residence and I wouldn't have to pay that extra money. So all that included, sometimes you'll find I've found myself in situations where I'm trying to balance all this extra stuff that I'm doing as a black student on campus and I'm trying to meet these deadlines and these expectations for my degree and that's my primary reason for being here like without this degree like all this extra stuff that I'm doing in a way like it's not founded if you know what I mean like I can't just come to the to Queens and make Queens student diversity project without being a, a Queens student if that makes any sense so in the back of my mom my mom's always reminding me like make sure you're putting in your your time to get your grades and everything now with the added complexity of university being you know difficult in your second year you know it's theory based I have barely any computer science background it's hard for everyone it's also hard for me when I'm going to my professors and my TAs for consideration and they're being super rigid because of these rules and stuff that have been placed that really only work for white people and that's the best way that I can explain how institutionali institutionalized racism disproportionately affects black students marginalized students on campus now one might ask okay like but these are just the rules like you know we don't we you know we can't do favoritism but it's like okay i'll give you a clear example so this particular uh class i'm, I'm in uh my, my professor says his his ta office hours are not ta office hours his office hours are from 1 to 2 p.m now from 1 to 2 p.m i have my meeting for qsdp and it was my meeting for, for like not the entire QSDP team, but like my executive team, like the senior exec, executive team. And I'm trying to explain to him, hey sir, um, I can't make this, this, not hey Siri, I said hey sir, mind your business. Anyways, so I tell him like, you know, this is the situation like, I really can't miss this meeting. Now, if it was any regular meeting, like just a regular one, I would have missed the meeting. But this was a meeting specifically right before we had a big event coming on up. So I told him what this meeting was. I told him why I couldn't miss it. He says, well, I'm sorry. Like, I can't really do anything for you. He says that if you really, if you need accommodation, if you need this, 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 you can go through the, the Queens, something, something. Just said something that was super dismissive. Didn't want to be bothered with it. And... You know, one might say like, oh, you know, that's within his right. Like he already has this, you know, this setup. And that's what, I, what I'm talking about when I say like these rules, these setups that have been made, they really only work for white people who don't have as much that they're carrying on on their damn shoulders. Like, and that's all I can, that's all I can really, really, you know, say to it, say to that. And majority of my teachers are old white men with the exception of like a few, um, I have like one a white lady, I had an Asian lady and um, a brown, a brown professor. Like, with, and those were like, just three three professors out of the many courses I've taken in this university okay so you know I feel like you know because these te these professors do not understand the weight that we're actually holding on our shoulders it's easy for them to just dismiss us when we talk about how how much we're balancing you know and so on an average day I would go to the library around 10 p.m. I made friends with the security guards, you know, I, I made friends with the Tim Hortons lady that worked the night shift because I'd be there 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. trying to cram and study in that like short period of time. And the thing about me is that my peak hours for studying are right in the very morning, you know, but I don't I don't have time to like, you know, do everything that I'm also doing, but then study in the morning when I have 830 classes and all these things. I think that the way, way schools can be um, like, you know, start to unpack this is a very small part of institutionalized racism, might I add. Like, there are deeper, much deeper rooted issues in institutionalized racism. I'm just specifically talking about how it's impacted me. I feel like they need to make rules, since they're so attached to these rules, that work for black students. You know what I mean? That, that put into consideration all the other things that we're doing in order to attend university. Like, I've had, um, I, rem I remember I was trying to explain to this one professor, and he's like, oh, so maybe you should quit this. A uh, dawn job then and I'm thinking like how privileged must you be to think that I can just up and quit this job that I'm working at that that you know this this place that I am that job and home it's not just a job it's also my home and think that I can just up and pay some you know $800 a month or you know let's go let's go average $600 a month in the they call it the student ghetto in the student ghetto like <laughs> Like, you know what I mean? Like, and he, he said it's so, like, cavalier. Like, maybe you should just quit this job and, you know, uh, you know, live off campus. Like, 
you know, your response to me coming to you about telling you how much I'm balancing is that. And a part of me can understand, like, you know, it's not really their problem. This this is not on the onus of professors. You know, they just come there, they do their job, they leave. You know, this is more of like an institution thing. I feel like these, these things that I'm complaining about need to be done on the higher level of like, uh, the deans and you know yeah the deans I think it, it really comes up to the deans and, and um, admissions and stuff like that like they need to be building structures that work for marginalized communities that put into consideration what it means to be from a marginalized community and from a lower income um, household and go to a rich white elitist school like it's not cheap to come here it's not easy to come here you know what I mean like part of Queen Student Diversity Project our work has been you know telling people to come to Queens. And when they ask about the money, I'm like, I ain't even gonna lie to you. It's expensive. Like, it's not cheap. You know what I mean? And putting, and when you come to Queens, like if you're not coming from a wealthy background, there are a lot of things you have to really think about, like working this job and working that job. And I feel like, you know, a lot of people have done it. A lot of people do do it, but we like, I feel like we need to, we need to put more pressure on the university to look at how their structures are disproportionately affecting black people and uh, marginalized communities. And I, I feel like, you know, looking back now, my second year wasn't tough because of the academics. I was struggling with depression. And I was also struggling with not really understanding how the system works. I'm just like, I'm like, you know, I study hard, I study smart. You know, my teacher in high school always said, don't study hard, study smart. But I'm studying smart and it's not working. So I'm like, okay, let me do a combination. Let me do study smart and study hard. I'm doing both and I'm still, only able to get a B, like what is going on? And I realized that once I was able to figure out the system, the, the moment it clicked, everything changed, like everything changed. And so because of second year, in second year, like a lot of times I tried to justify why I was doing so poorly in a sense, like I started to think about any, anything I've ever, any negative thing I've ever heard about you know, students from Jane and Finch growing up in, you know, going to school in Jane and Finch, that kind of thing. Like, uh, well, for me, it was Finch and Sentinel, but, you know, my, my middle school was in Jane and Finch or Jane and Jeffwood. I started to think about those. Like, they started to come up, you know, like, uh, I don't know if anybody else heard about this, but in my, in, in high school, we heard about this thing where um, the schools would do, like, you know, rankings and basically adjust your grade based on, the, based on the school that you went to. I don't know if that's based on any merit at all. Let me just put that out there. But... The, that's not what's important. The point, the, the, what's important is that that was what the perception was. And I didn't think it bothered me at the time until I'm in second year and I'm struggling and I'm thinking like, yo, like was, was it wrong for me to come here? Like, am I actually up to par with, you know, the other students that I'm, you know, that are in my, my, my program. And I really started to like really doubt myself a lot. I even remember messaging my math teacher one day and I'm like, I, I forget if I find the message, I'll put it here. But I was just like, I'm struggling. I'm barely able to make a B, da da da. And she responded with, to me with the most, just like, she was just like, you know, and usually because of how she used to push me in high school, a B would be unacceptable. And she didn't say it to me this time. She's like, well, you know, in university, it's a very different, a different experience. What you need to really do is just look at, look at how are, what's the average in the class and see, are you underperforming? Are you performing at, you know, where other people are performing? Or are you performing higher? You know, and, and she said like, look at that. And when I looked at that, well, I said, okay, I'm, I am, I'm doing average, but I'm not an average ass bitch, you know, like, you know, I'm not an average girl, you know what I'm saying? So it did help me in the moment, in that moment when I messaged her, but it, it didn't really stop me from thinking, okay, like, why am I not doing well enough? And I contemplated dropping out until that same teacher, she invited me to a panel back at CWJ, my high school. And she briefly mentioned to me, like, you know, I just really wanted to contact these students because, you know, we're having an issue where we're able to get students to to go to university, but then they're not staying. Like, there's a really high dropout rate. And I was thinking, like, um, plus one. <laughs> like, I didn't want to be the one to break it to her, but I'm like, yes, you are having an issue because... You know, and then that made me think like, okay, so is this an issue about the school that I came from? Like, is this just, just am I just gonna be another like, you know, uh, you know, black student that wasn't able to make it at a white institution? Like all that kind of stuff. Like I, w I was really like grappling with like, you know, really struggling with all those like narratives and rhetorics in my head and stuff like that. But once I started to do better in third year, I thought all that had went away until I'm about to apply for the scholarship and it's all coming back to me. Like, it's all just kind of like, you know, being like, you know, cool. Like, even though you've done really well in your third year, like that is still 
like a stain on your transcript that's never gonna go away like are they gonna be able to see that like all the story that I'm telling you right now cannot be conveyed through a transcript my story can't be conveyed through a transcript all that they see is what my end mark was you know and, and that sucks it's part of why I really don't really mess with transcripts you know that has stopped me from applying to jobs my transcript has stopped me from applying to internships like you know I've taken I've taken myself out of the running for from so many different things because of imposter syndrome and just also feel like I'm just not worthy because of that second year and so I called my mom and she was just like, you know what, like, it is what it is, but you're going to apply. She's like, oh, but that's what you're going to do. You, you're going to apply, you know? She persisted for a few days and then four days before it was due, she finally convinced me to actually, you know, apply. And so I just said, Nicole, you know what? The worst that can happen is that they reject you. But at least then you can say you at least applied. So I went to coffee shops day after day with my friends. I'll be doing like a little bit of this, da 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 da. And then 20 minutes before the deadline, I submitted and I said, God, if this is for me, this is for me, and I'll leave it like that. And that, that, that was that, that was the prayer. Nothing more, nothing less. If this is for me, it is for me. And done. And I put that like way back and I just went back into life. Okay? Maybe a month late, later, I get a Congratulations, you have been da 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 for the regional interviews. And I'm thinking. Me? <laughs> like, I'm really, I'm really like confused here, but I'm okay. Regionals, okay, they, they choose 150 people, but from like 800 plus applicants, I'm thinking like me? But okay, they chose me, cool. But I was still a little bit in shock. So for the regional interviews, I didn't really know how to prepare. Uh, I went to like these different, you know, uh, Zoom meetings where they were telling us how to prepare, but it still felt, felt very much like I was not deserving of it. But I, I went to this, the interview. I felt like I killed it. I was like, again, still telling myself, Nicole, like there are this many other, you know, applicants nationwide, probably with great GPAs, you know, contain your expectations. That's what I was thinking to myself, contain your expectations. Then I got the message or the phone call that you made it to the, the finals. So again, I'm thinking, like this entire time I was just scratching my head, like how, how am I progressing in this, you know? Now I wanna stick a pin in that. There's so many testimonies within testimonies that I don't even know where to, you know, go, go through. But by this time, they told us that, you know, you need to apply to McGill by January 15th. So Nicole being Nicole, wondering if she should apply or not, guess what I did? I applied on January 15th. And as God would have it, I got accepted on January 25th, 10 days after. And when I, when, I, when I put that application in, I told God, again, a lot, me and God, we have this very friendly relationship. So if, I, if I'm talking about him like this, it's just because that's how me and God, we communicate. I told God at this point, I had quite a, I, I'd zeroed my mind on either I was going to Miguel or I was going into industry. So either I'm getting a job as a software developer or I'm gonna go pursue my master's. And the reason why I thought about that was because I had fallen so much in love with this program and I knew exactly what I want. And I was not really willing to, to say, okay, you know what, I'll apply to all these other programs as my backups. I'm like, no more of that. Mm -mm -mm -mm. No, no more of that. Because I, I'm a worthy software developer, but I'm also a worthy student. So if, if God wants this for me, this is gonna be mine. So it was one of those things where it was like, my mom was like, oh no, just apply to UFT. So like, apply, apply, apply. Like, why are you gonna like, just give yourself one option. But for me, it wasn't about one option. It was about what I wanted. You know, I didn't want all these other programs. So if there were other programs that I actually wanted, I would apply to those also. But there was no other program that, you know, I saw myself in. And so the only other thing I saw myself in was working in industry. So I just applied to McGill and that was it. And I said to God when I applied, I said, if this is for me, I'll get it. If not, I'll go into industry. And against everybody's, everybody's, you know, two cents, I, I did that. And 10 days after, I applied on January 15th. On January 25th, I got my, my acceptance letter saying, update, uh, there's been an update to your um, application. Congratulations. I was like, I was bawling. I was, I was like, and not only did I, get, I, did I get accepted, I got accepted with money. Like they gave me like 25,000, like something, something along those lines. And I was just like, so at this point, and this was Jan like end of January, and this is before I even got into, like before I, I'm, I'm doing my actual finals, I was already a finalist, but I hadn't done my finals. And I'm like, okay, so regardless of the outcome of this scholarship, 
I'm already gonna be able to go to McGill. And that was very like, I was so like, I was from the bottom of my heart, like I was thankful, I was grateful. I was, I danced, my, I love, if you guys know uh, Buga, like any, any of my um, Yoruba, Nigerian people here, I listen to Buga um, by Jesse King. I listen to B Balanli by Jesse King. Balanli makes me, Balanli by Jesse King makes me feel like a bad bitch, period. Mm -mm -mm. I was just dancing, I was happy, like I was full of joy. I didn't tell anybody for like two days. N none of my friends knew for like two days before I actually like, you know, I wanted to just like, just really soak up, soak up that moment of like, wow, like I actually got in, you know? And, and I, I still don't know how, I still don't know why, but God. You know, like that's that's my own explanation. I don't know what the, their explanation is. I don't know what they saw, but all I see is God, and I'm thankful. And so now I go into my finals, and I'm like, you know, I'm, I did a little bit of Insta Instagram stalking. I'm looking at all these these applicants, and they are top notch. Like when I say top notch, I mean I'm getting intimidated. I'm thinking like, damn, Nicole, like, you know, you have your locals, you know, leadership this, leadership that, but these people have like started businesses and have done this, this, this. So I go into the finals and I left feeling good, but I also left feeling like there were some things that I didn't get to say. Like, you know when you, like you, you go, you do something and then you think, oh, I could have done this, I could have done that, I could have said this, I could have said that, all of this, like all these things were going through my head. Unlike the regional interviews. After the regional interviews, I felt very confident. I felt like, mm-hmm, I did that, mm-hmm. But after this one, I was kind of like, okay, I could have, like I did that, but I could have done this, could have done that. And I was like, okay, so I might have to break the news. I didn't get it in. And the turnaround for this scholarship is very quick. Like they don't make you wait no 3,000 years. They make you wait like three days. Okay, so in three days, you're gonna know exactly what what's happening. I had my final interview on March 12th, which was a Friday. And I got the I got the call, or rather, they invited me to a Zoom call the the next Monday, like right after the weekend. And so I'll insert some clips. So I just got um, a message from one of the admins at the McCall McVeigh Scholarship, and they said that I should uh, come to some Zoom meetings. I guess they've made their decision, and they're gonna be letting me know about their decision. And I'm like shitting bricks right now. I have like what four minutes till that meeting so i'll update you afterwards the wait from like from like 12 30 or till whenever they actually brought me to the zoom call felt so long but what was really long is when i got into the zoom call and they're like talking a little bit oh yeah we want to thank you so much for applying and how did you find the scholarship process and you know I, and i'm just like okay so they're just kind of butter me up to tell me that i didn't get it because nobody's going to talk this long <laughs> to tell me that i didn't get it and then they're like we're proud to win nails. Like, you what? The school is shit. Oh my God, guys, I got it. She got it. She got it. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. Look at my mom, she looks so good. I do. Mom, wow. Okay, but yeah, go. I got a, I got a. Let's go, let's go. Hey. Mom, okay, anyways, um, I got a Zoom call from the like, Call McBain Scholarship and you're looking at a member of the first cohort. It's been a long, mom, I'm trying to, hold on. It's been a long ride. Glory be to God, I'm so excited. Before they even finish, yak, 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 I'm like, mommy, like, I was so excited. Like, I cannot explain it. Like, I was so, I was so, like, it just felt like a rush of different emotions. Like, Nicole, you weren't about to apply, you stupid. Nicole, you did it, you did it. Like, I had so many different, like, things coming in my, in my head. Like, it just, boom, like, just like this. Like, it was just, it was a, oh, like, I just, Sing, I sang songs of praise because that's what I do when I'm happy. I sing songs of praise. If anybody knows Yinka Ayefele, I was singing Yinka Ayefele for like three days straight because I could not believe it. And at the same time, as happy as I was, you know, after getting selected, I was still having doubt. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God what if they come back and say they made a mistake? Like, what if they do this, this, this? Like, I don't know. I, I really have to shake off that whole imposter syndrome and, you know, not really, you know, believing in myself i'm still working on that but yeah i got the scholarship i'm a mccall mcbain scholar period period <laughs> I'm a i yeah my friends are so lovely like they literally came to my to my door and they brought me like muffins and croissants and all this kind of stuff cheesecake because i know a girl loves her cheesecake and they made me a really cute card and i just felt so like wow like do I even have words? Like, I don't think I do. Like, I never expected to get here. Not like this. Not, not like this ever. 
I, I thought that I would have a story of struggle, that I would have a story of like, you know, having to claw my way to get it because of how poorly I did. But God, like I said, what was mine was mine and God really came through for me. And that's my testimony. That's my testimony. From high school to undergrad to masters, my heart is full. Je tiens. Miguel? <laughs> I need to live French. I have Duolingo, I'm gonna work on it. But yeah, I just wanted to like share my testimony with you guys because I'm also grateful. And that mo that time from getting the acceptance, like getting selected and you know, announcing it on April 7th, it's just really a time for me to like really reflect and really thank God and really like just realize what a full circle moment this it, it is for me because there's just so many different like narratives and that that's placed on the Jane Finch community, placed on black people, like people that don't know anything. The last thing about our community that be just be see what they see in the news and then they just put that on, on, on us and that's that, you know what I mean? And it was so cool because at the McCall McBain Foundation, the CEO is also actually a CW Jeffries alum and we connected on that and I was just like, wow, like, you know, and, and I just, I don't know, like, I feel like you guys are about to see a bunch of successes come from the Jane Finch community because just even just thinking about the people that I, I went to high school with that I know from the area and, and seeing the stuff that they're doing now, like people are about to get bombarded with black excellence from the Jane Finch community, period. And I just feel so blessed and I feel so thankful. And I thank God for everybody that's had a part in my getting here because I didn't get here by myself, not by my power, not by my might. I'm just thankful. I'm just very, very, very thankful. And you guys showed me so much love uh, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, everywhere. Like you guys, so much. So you guys showed me so much love, and I just that continues to remind me, like a village, a village. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Bye, y'all. Hope you enjoyed my testimony.